So far, we've been assuming that the power sources we are using are ideal. This means, for example, that a 5 volt voltage source will provide 5 volts to our circuit regardless of the current required to deliver that voltage. Since there are no restrictions on the current, it's possible that an ideal voltage source can provide infinite power. Obviously, this is an unrealistic assumption under at least some conditions. We need to determine a better model for our power sources and decide under what conditions each model is appropriate. Likewise, we've assumed that our voltage and current measurements are ideal. This means that our voltmeters will behave exactly like an open circuit with infinite resistance, and our ammeters will behave like a short circuit with zero resistance. It turns out that these approximations, like our ideal power supply models, are only appropriate up to a certain point. Under some circumstances, we'll need to be able to modify these models to interpret our data. In this tutorial, we will do some tests to determine the power supply limitations on the analog discovery. We'll also explore the limitations of the voltmeters on both the analog discovery and our DMM. For now, we'll only worry about voltage sources since we have no actual current sources available to us. Our non-ideal voltage source model will consist of an ideal voltage source in series with a resistor. In Chapter 4, we'll see why it's appropriate to model a fairly complex circuit, like those used in the analog discovery, as a simple circuit like this one. For now, we'll just assume that this is appropriate. Now when we hook up a resistor to our voltage supply, we have the circuit shown here. This circuit allows us to model the limited current available from real voltage supplies. We can analyze the overall circuit as a simple voltage divider. We know the voltage difference across a series combination of resistors. Therefore, V out is equal to R over R plus R sub S times the ideal voltage source V sub S, and I sub S is simply V sub S over the total series resistance R sub S plus R. Now, as R goes to zero, under which conditions an ideal voltage source will give us infinite power, V out goes to zero, and I sub S goes to V sub S over R sub S. The previous model is generally only accurate over some range of output currents for any power supply you buy. The analog discovery, in particular, has a separate set of limitations on its voltage supplies to protect the USB port on your computer. The main limitation on the analog discovery power supply delivery is that the total current delivered by the USB to the device must be less than 600 milliamps. Attempting to exceed this current level will shut down the device. Without any active instruments, the analog discovery tends to consume about 400 milliamps or so of current. Once we've turned on some instruments and made some measurements, typically you have about 125 to 150 milliamps left for our power supplies to deliver to an external circuit. This current allocation is shared among all the power supplies on the device. V plus, V minus, the two analog waveform generator channels, and the 16 digital channels. In general, how the available power is distributed among the various supplies depends on the circuits you connect to the analog discovery. This approach provides the maximum degree of flexibility in the use of the discovery, but it does require that you, the user, understand how the device works. In addition to the overall power limitation placed on the device itself, there are some additional current limitations on the individual power supplies. I want to emphasize that these limitations are effective even if the total current provided to the device is less than 600 milliamps. The voltage instrument will provide at most 200 milliamps total to the V plus and V minus terminals. Given that the 600 milliamp current condition on the device, it's relatively unlikely that you will encounter this condition before the device itself shuts down. The wave gen instrument limits the output current to at most 50 milliamps for each channel. The analog discovery displays no warning or error message when this limit is exceeded. So keep this limitation in mind when using relatively small resistances in conjunction with the waveform generator. The only indication that this limitation is being exceeded is that increasing the wave gen voltage levels does not result in increased voltage or current actually being provided to the circuit. The digital channels can provide at most 5 milliamps of current per channel. 
The analog discovery current limitations can also be affected by the particular USB port being used. Some ports have less available power than others, and the power availability can vary from computer to computer or even from port to port on the same computer. A powered USB hub can always be used if you're encountering trouble with the power supply. Now, the non-ideal voltage source model we derived previously is appropriate as long as none of the above current limitations are exceeded. If we exceed the above limitations, the power supply shuts down or results in no additional power being provided to your circuit. We'll demonstrate the effects of some of these limitations in a minute or two, but first let's look at how we'll calculate the source resistance from measured data. For now, let's assume that none of the analog discovery's current limitations are in effect, so that our previous non-ideal voltage source model is appropriate. Under these conditions, we model our source as an ideal source in series with a resistance. Recall that in our source model, both V sub S and R sub S are not directly available for us to measure. In order to develop our model, we need to estimate these values. We can always get V sub S simply by open circuiting the terminals of our source and measuring the output voltage. Since there's no current out of the source, the voltage drop across the source resistance is zero, and our measured voltage here is simply the source voltage V sub S. The value of R sub S, however, is a bit trickier to obtain. To get R sub S, we can apply a load across the terminals, R, and measure the output voltage across that load. In this case, the current will not be zero. If we measure the load resistance, R, the output voltage V out, and the output current, I sub S, we can estimate the source resistance. Actually, we really only need two of the three of these parameters in order to estimate this resistance, but we'll look at two different ways to estimate the resistance using all three parameters. Please note that these relations that we'll derive are only good up to the point where the current limitations take effect. 50 milliamps for the wave gen instrument and a total of 200 milliamps for the voltage instrument. If we look at V out, by our voltage divider formula, V out over V sub S is equal to the ratio of the resistance R to the total resistance R sub S plus R. Inverting this means that V sub S over V out is equal to R sub S plus R over R. Solving this for R sub S gives us R sub S is equal to R times V sub S over V out minus 1. So if we know V out and R, we can estimate R sub S. Likewise, the voltage drop across here, V sub S minus V out, is equal to the source resistance, R sub S, times the source current, I sub S. Therefore, we can also measure, estimate R sub S is equal to V sub S minus V out over I sub S. So if we measure the source current and the output voltage, we can also measure R sub S. This is the circuit that we'll use to characterize the resistance of the arbitrary waveform generator. Obviously, in order to characterize the waveform generator, we'll use channel 1 of the AWG to apply an overall voltage to the circuit. Our load resistor will be a 47 ohm resistor. We'll measure the current through that resistor with our DMM, and we'll use channel 1 of the voltmeter instrument to measure the voltage across the load resistor. Now let's apply power to the circuit measure the response, and estimate the source resistance. Let's start out with a fairly low voltage applied to the resistor, one volt. Turning on the AWG, we get about a volt on our measurement of the voltage across the resistor, and we're getting about 20.4 milliamps. Let's record that data and estimate our source resistance. V sub S is 1 volt, V out is 0.95 volts, and I sub S is 20.4 milliamps. Now let's use our calculated data to estimate our source resistances. The first approach, R sub S, is equal to our load resistance, 47 ohms, times V sub S over V out, 
one volt over 0 0.95 volts minus one, which turns out to be 2.47 ohms. Our alternate approach in which we use the source current, R sub S is equal to V sub S minus V out, one volt minus 0 0.95 volts, over I sub S, which is 20.4 milliamps, that turns out to be 2.45 ohms. So our results are fairly consistent. Now let's start increasing the voltage across the load resistance. That will increase the current. We can see the limitations on the waveform generator's power max out. At 2 volts, we're getting still almost 2 volts across the load, 1.91 volts, and we're getting about 41 milliamps. If we continue to increase this to, say, 3 volts, now we're starting to see a significant difference between the channel 1 voltage and the desired voltage, which is 3 volts, and we see that our current is 50 milliamps. Continuing to increase this will increase neither the voltage across the load nor the current through the device. We've reached the saturation limits of the waveform generator. Now let's do a somewhat similar test, but use the voltage instrument to apply power to a resistor. Our voltage instrument is providing 5 volts between this terminal and this terminal. We have a 100 ohm resistor. We're measuring the voltage across the resistor with channel 1 of the voltmeter instrument. The current through the resistor is still being measured by our DMM. This time around, however, what we're going to do is successively reduce this resistance, increase the current, and see the result of attempting to draw too much power from your USB port. Turning on power, at 100 ohms, we're getting almost our full voltage across the load resistor, and we get about 50 milliamps of current. If I add another 100 ohm resistor in parallel with the first one, I have a 50 ohm overall resistance. This is starting to draw a significant amount of current from the device. We're seeing a reduction in the voltage across the load. We still have about 100 milliamps of current, and we get this warning here, discovery overcurrent. We have a high current condition. This warning will be displayed when you go above 500 milliamps of total current. Adding another 100 ohm resistor in parallel with this will get us down to 33 ohms overall. Now under this condition you'll get one or more dialog boxes that tell you an overcurrent has occurred. This dialog box here has an option where you can disable the 600 milliamp overcurrent protection. This will allow you to draw up to one amp from your USB port. If you decide to disable this, make sure that your USB port can provide the desired current. Now that we've estimated our source resistance, we can get a feeling for the conditions under which we can use an ideal source model without introducing excessive error. Recall that this is our circuit of interest. The relationship between the output voltage and the source voltage is this. If R is much, much bigger than R sub S, V out is approximately the same as V sub S, and we can model our source as v being ideal. Next, let's look at the effects of non-ideal voltage instruments on our measurements. Anytime we measure something, it changes the circuit we're making the measurement on. The goal is to have a measurement instrument whose effect on the circuit is insignificant. The trick is to determine what effect is insignificant. In this part of the video, we'll follow a process that's very similar to our estimate of the source resistance that we did previously, though we won't provide as much detail. Our model for a non-ideal voltmeter consists of an ideal voltmeter in conjunction with a resistance. Ideal voltmeters have infinite resistance, but we will have a finite resistance in our non-ideal voltmeter. So we're actually measuring the voltage across a finite resistance. When we connect a non-ideal voltmeter to, for example, this voltage divider, we're now putting a resistance in parallel with the resistor whose voltage is being measured. This means that we're changing the resistance 
of the system where we're measuring the voltage difference. Let's take a look at the effect this can have on our voltage measurements. Here's the circuit we'll be using. I'm using two 10 mega ohm resistors in series to create a voltage divider. I'm using the analog discoveries voltmeter instrument at the moment to measure the voltage across this resistor. I'm using the voltage supply to provide five volts across the two. The voltage across the second resistor should be about 2.5 volts. If I turn on power, however, I see that the voltage I'm actually measuring is only about 0.44 volts. The resistance of the analog discovery is low enough so that it's significantly contaminating our results. Now if I switch over to measuring the voltage across this resistor with my DMM, I do get more voltage out, about 1.73 volts. It's not, still not the 2.5 volts it should be, but this does indicate that this DMM has a higher internal resistance than the voltmeter instrument on the analog discovery.